Great. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to another office hour session. Uh, my name is Apurva Ashok. I am the Director of Open Education at the Rebus Community, and I'm joining you all today from Toronto and from the traditional lands of the Mississaugas of the First Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Hooded-Oshani, the Chippewa, and the Wendat peoples. I'm very grateful to be living here and working here and to join you remotely and to start a conversation about OER and language programs. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Karen, who is from the Open Education Network and who's been a wonderful collaborator these past four years or so that we've been running Office Hours events. Thank you, Apurva, and I am very happy to be joining all of you here today. I am coming to you from San Luis Obispo, California, the traditional land of the Chumash people. And today we're going to be talking about OER for language programs. We are joined by three guests. Unfortunately, Carl Blythe, who was expected to join us from Corel, is unable to make it today, but luckily um, we still have a couple people from the program who can talk about their experience. So um, the Open Education Network is a community of professionals working to make higher education more open. And one of the ways we do that is by partnering with the Rebus community, as Apurva said, for almost four years on these monthly office hours. If this is your first office hour session, just to orient you to what to expect in the coming hour, uh, we will hear introductions very briefly, about five minutes or so from our guests. And during that time, we invite you to think of questions and comments in the chat, because after their introductions, we'll turn things over to you to really drive the conversation um, and uh, hopefully uh, help you um, learn what you need for what you're interested in or what you're trying to do on your campus. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our guests. Today we are joined by Saddam Issa, Assistant Professor of Arabic at Michigan State University, Sarah Sweeney, Project Coordinator at the Center for Open Educational Resources and Language Learning, otherwise known as Corel, and Christian Hilchi, senior lecturer in the Department of Slavic and Eurasian Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. And today we're talking about OER for language programs and Sarah is going to kick us off. Great. Thank you. And thank you for having us today. Um, so as Karen said, I am Sarah Sweeney. I'm the project coordinator at CORAL. Um, so CORAL is based at UT Austin, so I'm coming to you from Austin today, um, we're, but we're funded by a federal grant, uh, a Title VI grant that is meant to increase the capacity of foreign language learning in the United States. So uh, we do a lot of work with people in Texas, but we also work with people all over the country um, with teachers, faculty, and students to develop OER. Uh, so we've developed full curricula, textbooks, PD modules, lesson plans and videos and all sorts of other things. Uh, and we also do professional development. And I wanted to, while I mentioned that, I'm gonna put two links in the chat before I forget. So we have a professional, we have some office hours of our own coming up, which are different than these office hours. They're just um, for dropping in and asking questions. And then we also have a course about what we are specifically for language educators. And then we also do workshops for teachers about OER and also about language teaching. Um, and I guess, so a little bit about CORAL, we started in, we started as a different center, uh, maybe about 15 years ago, and but we've been an official language resource center for 11 years now. And uh, when we first started out, we developed a lot of bigger projects that were really heavy, uh, heavily developed like in the back end. So we had web developers doing, um, creating platforms for the content. But uh, as we've gone on, we've kind of progressed to making more resources that are more uh, smaller scale or using tools that already exist and advising people. So they won't need as much professional help developing the resources, but they can do it themselves. Um, and so along with, and of course, that's because that makes the resources more adaptable. And um, then it, it allows us, I think, also to work on more projects with people because we're giving we're putting the tools in the hands of the people. Uh, so we've been using H5P a lot more recently and Google Docs, but we also use WordPress a lot. And um, of course, that adaptability is also perfect for language learning because languages are always evolving and changing. So uh, it's really nice to be able to make edits whenever you need to. 
And we've also been focusing more on uh, emphasizing to people the practices of open education, not just the resources themselves. So kind of starting starting off uh, really developing resources, but now we're really trying to emphasize the practices as well and build a little bit of a community. Um, and I guess I'll talk a little bit about the benefits of OER specifically for language learning, although I think that probably the other uh, language faculty will probably do a better job of that and get into the specifics more, but we found that OER is so rich for language learning just because I, um, there's so many opportunities to use authentic materials and just go out on the internet and find all these different examples of language and culture being spoken by all sorts of different speakers. Um, so that's one really great benefit and you can also show a lot of linguistic variety with authentic resources, um, whereas like a lot of traditional language textbooks just have maybe, you know, one way of, of speaking a more traditional um, standardized language. And then also there's just so many different modalities for practicing speaking, listening, reading, and writing. So we use a lot of tools or a lot of our project directors um, use a lot of different tools that aren't necessarily open source actually, but that are open access. So for example, Hypothesis for social reading or Vokey or Quizlet, those can all be integrated into the OER as well. Um, and a lot of times we'll do that by linking out to those, those resources from the resources on our site. And then another thing too that we focus on because of our grant is less commonly taught languages and uh, that includes indigenous languages as well. And so Christian will address the less commonly taught languages because he's in Czech. But um, we've, we've found that when people develop resources for less commonly taught languages, because they're OER, they get a lot more visibility uh, because people want to learn those languages, but there aren't as many resources. And um, also a lot of less commonly taught languages, maybe publishers aren't as willing to publish new materials for them. So people often find that there's old textbooks that aren't, that are kind of using old fashioned approaches to language teaching. So OER really offers an opportunity to get more visibility for um, less commonly taught languages and to update the pedagogy. So that's basically all I was planning on saying, but I look forward to hearing everyone's questions. Thank you, Sarah. Over to you, Saddam. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Thank you for inviting me uh, to talk about our experience with uh, OER at Michigan State University. Um, uh, as Apura and Karen stated that I am uh, an assistant professor at the linguistics department at Michigan State University uh, teaching Arabic. Uh, I would like to start uh, talking about uh, how the idea of uh, developing an Arabic OER uh, textbook uh, started. Uh, I guess it started maybe 14 years ago uh, without being really aware uh, uh, about it uh, when I came to the States uh, for uh, the very first time as a Fulbright uh, scholar teaching Arabic at uh, uh, below uh, college in Wisconsin. At that time, I was teaching Arabic and that was the, my very first exposure to teaching Arabic to non-native speakers of Arabic. At that time, I, you know, uh, had the opportunity to uh, also uh, study uh, foreign languages. So I studied uh, French and, th and that's where, uh, you know, the comparison uh, started. Uh, the comparison between the Arabic uh, textbooks available at that time with the uh, French uh, textbooks. Obviously, Arabic is totally different from uh, French or uh, Spanish, uh, but uh, with regards to for uh, certain areas, we thought that uh, we should, you know, uh, tap on uh, the French or Spanish uh, textbooks, like uh, organizing textbooks based on themes, which is lacking in the Arabic uh, textbook. Uh, obviously, a, a year after, I also started to study uh, Spanish at the University of Wisconsin Madison when I joined uh, the university as a PhD student. And I was also teaching as uh, teaching uh, teaching Arabic as a teaching assistant. Uh, the, and that's where, as I said, the idea uh, of creating an Arabic uh, textbook that in principle 
mimics the structure of the French and uh, Spanish textbooks. I was, maybe I'm a little bit exaggerating, but to say that I was able to study Spanish and French by my own without the help of the teacher, because the textbooks are so wonderfully uh, structured, thematically based, lots of videos, authentic videos, lots of pictures. It was uh, communicative and it was, they were actually based on actual guidelines, which is, in my opinion, and my colleagues uh, in the Arabic program who helped, uh, who co-authored the Arabic UR textbook with me, agree on that the Arabic textbook, the current Arabic textbooks, are not based, first of all, in, uh, they, they, are, they don't have themes, and they are not based on actual guidelines. And that's one of the driving forces for us to start this, this project, uh, to fill this huge uh, gap. Uh, notably also, uh, about 75% of the students who study Arabic in first year drop Arabic by the end of second year. And part of it based on our conversation with the students is the dif uh, difficulty of the, of the language. Yes, Arabic obviously is one of the most uh, for challenging languages, uh, but I believe that there are other techniques that could help students to have better proficiency in Arabic. One of them in, uh, in my opinion is design the Arabic textbooks based on themes, as well as the, the activities that are included in the textbooks are, you know, aligned with actual guidelines and a can-do statements. Uh, although the Arabic textbook, the current Arabic textbook or the most uh, popular textbook that we're using uh, is very popular and it's you know almost used in every university in the States, it's called Al-Kitab, which means uh, uh, the book, but it is not based on actual guide, uh, guidelines. Believe it or not, after six weeks, we spent the first six weeks teaching the students the alphabets, which is understandable. Because, but after six weeks, the very first word that students learn is the United Nations. Literally, you may laugh, you smile, but this is totally uh, fine. And this is a reality. Soon, the very first word the students learn after they finish with the alphabets is the United Nations. Whereas uh, uh, in, in Spanish, for example, we, start, we learn words related about talking about yourself, study, uh, then about chopping, fruits, vegetables, colors. Colors in the, uh, in the current Arabic textbook uh, are introduced in third semester Arabic. So now, in my opinion, uh, this encouraging for students to continue studying Arabic because students, obviously, the easiest part to talk about is ourselves, our surroundings, food, colors, clothes, and so on and so forth. So in the Arabic program, uh, so that was the first driving force. Then in 2016, we had the chance to create hybrid classes. So uh, we teach Arabic every single day, five days a week. So we, we emptied Friday to be totally online. And we, uh, and, uh, we created like a communicative lesson for our students, either to prepare students to the classes on Mondays or to recycle uh, the concepts that they have uh, learned like uh, during that week. And that's also sort of prepare us to our OER uh, textbook. Then we sat in, our, in one of our Arabic meetings, uh, Arabic program meetings, and we said, okay, let's uh, do something different. And the idea to create a textbook obviously is a very laborious process, it requires really lots of money and lots of resources. And the easiest part was to create an open uh, resource. And that's where we officially started, you know, uh, our project. But also we had also to get some other fundings uh, to, you know, host uh, experts in the field uh, to do a pedagogy on that or a workshop on that. And I, we actually, we invited uh, Christian Hilchi to, par to participate in that uh, pedagogy. But unfortunately, that pedagogy uh, workshop has been canceled due to COVID. Uh, so, but we're th still thinking of uh, holding it since we still have uh, the funding. So we have we've been introduced to actually uh, the OER um, uh, at the library at MSU and Regina uh, going who's uh, here 
helped us tremendously uh, to really create that open resource for our students that primarily, first of all, uh, design uh, communicative activities and task-based activities based on actual gui gui uh, guidelines and uh, can-do statements. Um, and also uh, create textbooks that are thematically based. Thank you, Saddam. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, thank you so much for the introduction to that book. I wanna hand things over to Christian and then we'll definitely get back to um, hearing more about your project. Hi everybody, um, thank you uh, also for having me here today. I'm really glad to uh, speak with you. Um, so I'm gonna be telling you a little bit today about uh, my project, Reality Check. Um, I'm sending Reality Check uh, to you now, the link um, in the chat, uh, if you wanna take a look at it. Um, I do really well with some media in the background. So I've actually uh, uh, selected some slides to uh, share with you today. Um, reality Check, when it got started, I really, did not plan on it being this huge project that it ended up being, but it really just kind of naturally snowballed. Um, a lot of that had to do with how I began to understand um, the affordances of, of open and really what open will allow us to do um, in terms of integrating all sorts of uh, media into our lessons and our classrooms. Um, so here you can just see some 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 of the data about about the textbook itself, um, and um, something that Sarah mentioned when she was talking about it. Uh, the idea with the textbook is that it it, it be um, as open as possible and really sort of um, capture the the essence of those five R's that we really want our our anybody who uses it to be able to remix and reuse the content, retain it um, in any way that they see fit. So you can, for example um take any of that content and open it and create a copy in, um, in your own google drive or download a pdf or a word document of any of the lessons the 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 actual title reality check was something that i developed because i was looking at the kind of content i was planning which was originally this this these these sets of interview questions um this is all based on actual guidelines um the real problem with so many of the text, uh, Czech textbooks out there was that we had so much of a focus on grammar and so little focus on actual communication. And so I, um, I wanted something that would get the students talking constantly. Grammar would be the tool that helped them talk, not the reason that we were studying the language. We weren't studying the language so that we could learn different grammatical forms and gra grammatical phenomena. And so it was, we, I call it reality check be, specifically because it was based on these reality style videos. Um, there are over 240 of them that, that I created for the textbook and they all um, are focused around these questions. Here's one, for example, um, what do you do when your head hurts? Um, I won't actually bother playing the video for you all, but you can go, sorry, when you have a headache, that, that was a, a direct translation of the, of the English when your head hurts or, or of the check rather. So uh, the, the speakers in this and um, will we'll answer sort of, you know, you know, usually I have a drink of water or usually I take a, you know, a pain pill or something like that. Um, and so this notion of then getting my students to listen to other speakers talking about this and then getting them to also share their own lives and their own experiences. Um, so it gets them to understand checks and check culture um, it also gets them to share this kind of information with each other, make comparisons. And so this is really all um, directly uh, influenced by uh, actual guidelines and, and, and really what we need to be doing in our classrooms and, and making those sorts of comparisons. Um, uh, so um, let me skip past that. It's a flipped classroom, um, a blended classroom. And so I have my students really learn most of the what they um, what they need to know before they even walk into class through these various pre class lessons. In class, then we take lots of time to uh, to just practice the language, whether it's playing little games to learn vocabulary or asking questions about you know what they like to do on vacation or or various things like that. And then post class gets them to write, gets them to really express themselves a lot using what they learned. Um, and what they practiced in class. 
So we, we really build every day, and this, this is sort of this wash, rinse, repeat every day, and really trying to build those skills. I like to use, as you've seen through these slides, I like to use a lot of images, and that's what I sort of alluded to at the beginning, the affordances of open. The more images, I mean, there are just people out there sharing all this great content with us, and why not utilize it? And you know what I realized is there's almost, if you can imagine it, there probably is a free image out there for you. I mean, I just wanted to give a sort of what I would call an extreme example. I wanted to give my students the language, the, the, I wanted them to be able to talk about what the weather was like yesterday. And so that they could talk about, for example, it rained yesterday, so I stayed inside, or it was sunny yesterday, so we went on a trip. And so, you know, here you can see just an, an example of an image that's evocative, that puts the students into the mood to learn about this topic, whether in the past, what was it like? Um, or what do you usually wear by mining the Flickr account of one user who posted a lot of pictures of themselves and put them all under an open license? I'm able to give an example of what this person usually wears. So there's a lot out there that, that, that we, can, um, we can use. And also I discovered vlogs. And really there are all these vlogs that are available for our students to be able to take advantage of. And because they're open, I can retain them, I can modify them, and I can do all of the things that we love about OER. Um, and so really this whole process of creating a textbook changed my pedagogy and changed the way I started to think. And I started to think differently about how we create materials. I started to really think open. What does that mean? And for me, my curriculum, how I planned it in the beginning, which was I have this idea for check and this is when, what it's gonna look like. I made this whole sort of elaborate plan for check. You know, we need to have this in unit one, this in unit two. A lot of it was very much based on grammatical phenomena. What, you know, we need to have this and then sequence it in this way and, and the like. But that really changed because what we end up doing is we kind of impose a lot of our own sort of um, you know, baggage onto what, what we believe you know, should be taught in a language course, what we have maybe, for example, experienced in other textbooks that we've taught out of. But I like to take this, this metaphor of a farmer's market because there's so much great content out there that we can adapt and use for our own uses, right? We, when I go to a farmer's market, I can't necessarily predict there are gonna be tomatoes there. Here's an example where you don't see a single tomato in sight, but you do see some really great produce. And when I go to a farmer's market, something I really love to do, I, I take a look around what looks good today. And so for me, the idea of designing an open curriculum was about seeing what's out there. What can I build on? How can I build on the successes of others? They're great material that they've shared with all of us. Um, and so that's been sort of my um, journey in a very sort of uh, uh, very quick nutshell, um, what, it, what it has meant for me to create in an open, you know, create open materials. It's this, it was this very transformative, um, this very transformative experience. It very much transformed the way that I think about pedagogy and how I can offer the best learning environment for my students. So with that, I will. I will uh... Thank you, Christian. And I, I like the, the metaphor you carry through. And I'll just uh, mention, as Karen has indicated in the chat, um, this is really uh, the time where we turn it to all of you to continue the lovely conversation that all three of our guests have started. So if you have questions or comments or thoughts, or if you're working on language OER projects of your own and would love some advice about where to source images or videos or vlogs or all of the rest, or create those interactive activities that I've seen in Saddam's book, please do go ahead and begin asking. Um, while maybe folks are thinking of a question, I might pose one to um, the three guests to kick off the conversation. Um, I noticed in uh, Saddam's book, which I was browsing while he was speaking earlier, and Christian with yours as well, that there are just numerous non-textual elements that go into making a language book more engaging, dynamic, and essentially useful for students. Um, where do you start off with the, the planning or the sourcing around these elements? Um, and 
Uh, Caitlin is asking in the chat, what interactive elements or activities have your students been most excited about or engaged by? Feel free to jump in any of you and um, answer this question as it applies to your languages, to your contexts, to your books. Can I start? Uh, well, uh, uh, honestly, uh, I think uh, what excites the students most is they have uh, they have uh, particular themes, and the themes for each respective level is suitable to that level. So first year. Uh, Etc. They have really related. So then we lost you briefly. You were mentioning with first year. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. So uh, for first year, for example, so students have topics related to things that they would like to talk about, unlike the you know the other textbook, and the, the vocabulary uh, that we integrated in these themes are practical. So they can talk about themselves. They can talk about the surroundings. They can talk about colors and not wait a year and a half till, for example, to be introduced to, to colors. Second, it's interactive. So the students can really communicate with the textbook independently, okay, at their free times, okay? And there's self-check, obviously. Uh, uh, there is also circulation of the vocabulary. So in a grammar section, you'll find, let's say, activities where have sentences that circulate the vocabulary. Also, uh, readings, okay, uh, as well as a culture. Uh, third, I, I thought that also is, is, this, my students really get excited about the images that we, we have, the authentic videos that we uh, uploaded there. Uh, something sort of missing in the uh, current Arabic uh, textbook. Thanks, Adam. And Christian, it looks like you also had more to add. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, so in terms of, there were two questions there, right? What what most excites our students as well as how do we kind of go about this process? Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll start with that second question. You know, what 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 do I do to, to start off and, and how do I kind of go about that process? Um, and it, it kind of directly goes back to um, what I ended with in my um, presentation, because I've, I've tried, for example, you know, a lot of times, when I have an example sentence or many example sentences to, to, to demonstrate some sort of new phenomenon, new vocabulary or whatever, I, I started sometimes with the sentence and then tried to illustrate it. And that wasn't always that fruitful. Um, and so a lot of times actually I would go on kind of an image search um, and start just playing around, seeing what's out there. Um, and then I would find images that would inspire me. So letting yourself get inspired by what's out there, I think um, is really a fruitful way of going about things. Um, in fact, actually, um, when I've had to do it the opposite way, it, it ends up being very stressful. Um, and so, so I really like that, 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 that sort of building on the content that's already out there. Um, as for looking for images, I mean, there's a lot of uh, open image repositories that I utilize. Um, you know, every you know, my favorite uh, places to go are either Wikimedia Commons or um, Flickr. Um, Flickr is really actually fantastic, um, even if um, you can't necessarily find through a search exactly what you're looking for. And I'll I'll give you an example right now. I'm also working um, on the images for a Croatian textbook, and and sometimes I can't exactly find the the precise place that I need, but I can sometimes find somebody's album from a trip. And I can just kind of leaf through and I can find, oh, they didn't label it, but I can find their, their image so I can find some theater or I can find some cafe downtown or something like that. Um, but so, so I, I, take, I look at those resources. There's also a lot of um, uh, public domain um, uh, resources that are available. So um, uh, you have uh, uh, things like openclipart.org, you have, um, uh, sites that offer, offer um, open images that are under similar open licenses, but not quite public domain, like Pixabay um, or Pexels and, and things like that. These are all images that are free for us to use. Um, and so the second question that you asked was how, what, excites, um, uh, what excites my students the most. I think what they really enjoy is that we don't have any 
in class instruction. We just practice the language the whole time. And that means we're playing games. We're getting doing group work. We're doing pair work. We're doing presentations. It feels authentic. And I think that authenticity that bringing both real, you know, whether it's videos, vlogs that I find, or some of these interview videos that I, that I created, that really makes the language feel living versus when I used an older textbook that was very, I mean, it was black and white, very few images, lots of walls of text, things like that. It was hard to really feel connected to the text, the language, and, and what we were doing. So um, I know that's kind of a more vague kind of answer, but that's, um, that's I get, yeah, so. Thank you. Um, Amy had a question in the chat. There's great conversation going on in the chat. Amy would like to hear from all of you about uh, the work and considerations you make in making the resources fully accessible. She has a few projects going and some interesting questions are coming up. Feel free to unmute me, Amy, if you want to talk about some of those questions. But oh, here they are. I should just read the next sentence. For example, with languages that use different alphabets and characters from English, Arabic, Japanese, or alt text for images that don't uh, defeat the learning goals, et cetera. Thoughts on accessibility? I can say that the alt text is the next step for reality check. We're we're not quite there yet, um, but uh, it's it's certainly necessary and something that we should all strive towards doing. Um, I put all the alt text in English um, because I don't I don't I think the purpose of my images are so that they can see something that they that can correspond to the check text. Um, if you're visually impaired, you want to be able to see a description of what that is that you can understand fully so that you can see how it connects to the Czech text. For me to put it into the alt text into Czech, I don't, I mean, I, I, I don't mm -hmm. know if that would serve the purposes necessarily of, of, of alt text. So I have, I haven't had to worry about, uh, about that at all. Um, but I could see some 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 reasons to put alt text in, a, in 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 the target language. I just haven't run across that yet for my own project. Sarah, how do you handle that at Coral? Uh, well, we're a little bit in the same boat. We've just started really addressing all these accessibility things, so it really depends for our resources and. Um, like some of our resources have video transcripts and some don't, but now we're trying to make sure all of them do. Um, and we really, I think most of our projects do not have alt tags yet. So we've been starting to talk to project directors about starting to add them. So yeah, that's something where we're pretty behind on, but I do, I, yeah, I agree with what Christian was saying about the, uh, putting it in English. So it's, Easy, easy to read for students. I've also been thinking that maybe, well, we haven't tried this yet, but I was kind of thinking that that could be like a fun open pedagogy project for students because I know I've like gone to accessibility workshops where um, they have you come up with fun alt texts for images. So I don't know, maybe the students could uh, work on the textbook and add their own alt text or something like that. Cause it does, yeah, it's, um, it's a big job sometimes if there's so many images and it would be nice to, I think, get a lot of people involved in that task. And Regina has been saying in the chat that um, the second year OER that Saddam and Iman have been working on is undergoing an accessibility check. Saddam, Regina, did either of you want to describe what the process has been um, for the first year book released already? Regina, Regina you're, you're muted. muted. Yeah, I am muted. So the book that we are now that's now available at the MSU publishing uh, page is actually the first year, second semester um, OER. So right now, what what's what I just put in the the chat is that the the first year, first semester book, right? 
Saddam, that's a beginner Arabic, is already finished. Um, we've done the copy editing, and Saddam and Ayman are teaching with that OER in the classes uh, for fall, but we're not yet ready to release it to the whole world because we're still doing the full accessibility check. And like what I said in the chat, um, I give that first semester to the faculty to teach with the OER, refine and incorporate the feedback from the students so that they can uh, make the necessary changes. Um, you know, typically I release it as soon as the semester is over or beginning um, January so that we offer a resource that is robust, high quality for the other um, faculty to adopt and revise as they see fit. Yeah, that's a wonderful plan. And I especially appreciate the time you've taken to really make sure that you're getting the student feedback because with a lot of language OER in particular, you want to make sure that it's meeting those goals that you've set out. Um, I'm seeing another question in the chat from May, who teaches classical Chinese. Um, she's wondering, and maybe this is for Christian, where do you find those vlogs? Uh, how, what's the search process like? So yeah, so the discovery of vlogs, um, it happened one really late evening. I was, I was still trying to figure out what reality check was gonna be. Um, and um, I mean, I'll just admit, it was a little bit rudderless at that point. Um, and I started going online and I, I, I knew that, for example, YouTube and Vimeo allow you to put a open license on your content, but my searching up to that point hadn't yielded a whole lot of great content. And then I realized that there were several international words that users all around the world apply to their videos. These international words, whether it, I mean, I, I, I did a little bit of, you know, just kind of looking around, um, they're in English, but you might have some, uh, somebody who does French uh, video, videos in French or Spanish or German or Czech or Russian, um, even scripts that don't use uh, the Latin alphabet and they'll still put in their, uh, their, their title um, something like vlog. So um, I started actually Googling vlog and I would actually, uh, or not, sorry, not Google, but actually going into, into YouTube and vlog and then just any other word out there that I was, was curious about. So for example, vlog Christmas or vlog vacation. Um, and that led me to start to discover um, not only really good content, but really good creators of content. So I would go to them to their channel and realize not only do they have a few videos that are titled vlog, but they have a couple dozen other videos that have other titles and they're also under a Creative Commons license. And so this allowed me to really quickly get way more content than I could ever, ever, ever handle. Um, and so, um, so yeah, but I, I mentioned some of these other internet, there's some of these international words. So another one is time lapse. Um, so uh, this is something that, for example, I've been using in my first year Czech class over the last couple of weeks. Um, they have just been introduced to uh, a good number of vocabulary words and we're starting to learn the plural. So what happens if I see a time lapse of a city? What are the things that I, I see? Well, I see cars, I see buildings, I see trees, I see buses, I see trams, I see right all these different things that suddenly I can get the students to watch this time lapse video. Drone videos work the same way. I can get them to then describe just what are the things that you see. List you know list list them all out. Um, additional ones were, um, for example, hall. Hall is, a, is actually an international word. And if you're not uh, familiar with what a hall is, it's where somebody maybe buys a lot of different clothing items um, and then they try them all on. And there are a lot of hall videos that are, that are, that are uh, open. Um, uh, addition, there's unboxing. That's a, a commonly used <laughs> international word. Um, I haven't had a lot of success with unboxing, or I rather I haven't really tried very hard to put an unboxing video um, into, into my language classroom. Um, I'm, I'm forgetting some, I'm sure, but but that basically gets at it that they're the, uh, the actually I have them listed right here. Um, when Christian, I, when maybe, I find them all. Yeah. yeah, as you think of them, please drop them in the chat. Yeah, it's so will. fun to hear about them and think about 
sort of all the ways the internet can be leveraged for um, language learning, like an unboxing video. Um, <laughs> it's really fun to imagine. So um, the next question is from Liz, and I think we've talked a little bit about this um, in the chat as well, but um, maybe specifically uh, for Saddam and Christian, but also generally for Sarah, are textbooks written for one year or multiple year studies? Um, is there sort of a, a traditional way it's done in language learning? Is that changing? Um, I think many of us can think back on our time spent learning a language and often there would be maybe one book for one year. Is that still the case? How is it, how is it working? I'm happy to, 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 to start on that one. Um, right now, Reality Check is almost, uh, is primarily a first year textbook. Um, however, the way that I'm developing now is I'm developing additional chapters that one could not conceivably cover in the first year. And so the, the idea is everybody has a different sort of setup. I mean, for example, um, I was teaching five days a week um, and I know other universities might have a check class that's three days a week. And so um, for me to create a book that's necessarily going to be called first year, well, it really just depends on how much you meet and how much you can cover in that year. Um, right now, I, for example, cover eight chapters in the first year. I used to cover 10, but I, I found that pace, that, that pace a little bit too fast. So we have 10 chapters that are developed right now that were the first year curriculum, but now I'm actually pushing two of those chapters into the second year and developing two more chapters. So, I mean, at this point, I'm, I'm quite a good ways towards what will eventually be something that could be used in the second year curriculum and beyond. Um, I, I don't, I, 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 I don't know what it means to be a second year book anymore. I know what it means to increase to help what to help my students gain more and more proficiency, but as if there's some sort of artificial cutoff that this is what makes first year and this is what makes second year. I, I just I don't know if I truly understand what that is anymore. Um, so mm -hmm. um, that's that's where we are. I'm just continually I'm just continuing the development process and just basically stacking more on top of it. Um, and so yeah. Yeah, thank you. Sarah, is there anything in the Coral catalog that's sort of typical starting point or trends? I would say most of the resources are for first year, um, but then we hear from people like using our resources all over the country who are using them in all different ways, like spread across two years or condensed into one semester even, or yeah, so it seems like people are really using them all different ways. Mm -hmm. And then I, I think some people are developing more modular things now too, which might not work as well for beginning language courses, but for intermediate language courses where the students already have a foundation, um, can make different modules on different topics or something and kind of mix them, mix and match. Super. Um, Saddam, there's a, uh, feel free to respond to that. I know we've talked about your um, uh, different books for first and second year. There's also a new question in the chat uh, and we'll start with you. How long did it take you to develop your textbook? How many people collaborated with you? You have a co-author and um, I know Regina supported your work. Um, so maybe you could talk about that support as well as any stipends and release time to develop your textbook. Uh, well, thank you. That's a good question. Uh, the, the short answer is, you know, when we start really uh, writing the actual uh, textbook, probably a year and a half, two years for, for first year. Uh, but uh, the idea also started when we were doing our hybrid uh, classes uh, starting 2016. So we use some of the materials that we use for the hybrid classes and obviously develop them and uh, refine them for the um, uh, Arabic textbook. It's a very laborious process. It's uh, me and my colleague in the Arabic program, uh, you know, we, we used to spend tens of hours of work uh, per week uh, till we're done with, uh, uh, with, the, with the first uh, semester Arabic textbook and second semester Arabic, which is for the uh, for whole for first year. We're thinking of doing it for the, the second year, but we haven't really uh, practically started. We really want to see how uh, the first book uh, or the first year OER textbook works with the students and see the results, actual results since we are implementing and piloting 
edge with our first year students. And uh, obviously we can engage that through different ways. Obviously observation, because we're teaching uh, that uh, uh, course, maybe ask students formally and informally to provide their uh, feed feedback. But um, more reliable scientific way is to really conduct uh, some OPIs with the students towards the end of each semester and see whether the students really score the, you know, uh, the language uh, the appropriate language proficiency level at that uh, particular point of uh, the semester. And then look at the data and results and, you know, obviously move forward or not, but so. Thank you, Stam. Regina, feel free to jump in if there's anything you want to add about um, just the, the program structure or support. Um, I have a um, question for you, Sarah. You talked a little bit about how CORAL is shifting from you know, the resources and focusing on the resources to moving towards practices and supporting you know, open practices. Can you say a little bit more about that shift and, and what that looks like? Uh, yeah, well, I would say that um, we're still developing resources with people. I mean, and I, yeah, I don't want to say that we're developing the resources because the project teams are developing in them and we're supporting them. But um, I think, so yeah, although we're still like churning resources out, um, we're just trying to have more projects that are a little bit more collaborative. Like, for example, we have um, a a community for teaching Spanish as a heritage language. And so there's like a community website on there where teachers can go and ask questions and share ideas with each other. And we collect resources there from all different places and they all have open licenses on them. And then um, at our workshops, we tell people about the licenses. So, that, so the main point of the workshop is to learn about teaching Spanish as a heritage language, but then people also learn a little bit about OER at the same time. So. Mm, yeah, that's one example of how we're just trying to like build a community around OER and then get people in touch with each other and um, they can share open ideas at the same time as learning about language teaching as well. And then, um, and also we're trying to get students more involved in that slowly. So that's something I think we can work a lot more on, but um, yeah, so that's one example. Thanks, Sarah. I'm wondering, could you possibly maybe drop into the chat a link to the um, vast language collection that you have at Coral? Because I've come across so many resources from your site that I've sent to other uh, educators, instructors. I know Christian and Saddam have both shared their books as well. Um, I also noticed this week that Pressbooks has put out a language learning collection in their directory. I've just dropped in a link to that. Um, one of the things that I've always found when I'm supporting language learning projects is to just scour the repositories and databases and the open textbook library as well for um, other language OER. Um, even if it's not in the same language as, as the one the teams might be producing, it's just so nice to get the inspiration from others. Like today with the vlogs from uh, Christian and with all the H5P and just the methodol methodological approach that Saddam was describing. It looks like we have about eight minutes left. So I might just encourage folks in our audience, if you have any burning or final questions, please do drop them in now. Speakers, if you have any questions for each other, please feel free to ask away. And Sarah, thank you. It's nice to see that um, there's also the, the badging incentive for folks to um, develop language OER and to submit and be featured on the CODL site. Well, I had a question for Saddam, if there's time to address this. So when you mentioned the OPIs, I was wondering if you ever, if you actually tested this out, like if you tested your students' proficiency levels when they were using the old resources and compared that to when they were using your OER, because I would be curious to see that research. Yes, that's the, actually the best way to do it, uh, to really uh, come up with the scientific, reliable uh, sort of uh, data. Uh, I did not officially really uh, think of uh, your methodology, but I think I should uh, do that. Uh, uh, 
uh, we were thinking of testing the students after they are done, let's say, with, the, with this current semester, since we are already using it. Uh, 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 also, the second uh, semester in the, in the, uh, after the end of the, sp the spring. Uh, but uh, I get, I am in the Arabic program. I'm the one who is responsible for, you know, uh, conducting the placement tests. And part of the placement uh, test is doing sort of an official oral proficiency interview. And I know, you know, where students at. I have obviously uh, the, uh, the the recordings of the, of these uh, placement tests, and I have the scores. Uh, I can compare, you know, uh, obviously the scores, the old scores with my future scores, and see, you know, if there is a, a difference. Uh, and yeah, that that could also give us. Uh, uh, a better idea. I mean, I have the old ones, uh, the old uh, tests, those who studied the old textbook. Then I will be having, by the end of this semester and the spring, a new uh, sort of uh, uh, tests and compare them with the old ones. But that's a good, uh, really, way of looking at it. Good suggestion. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate it. Thank you. So as you may know from reading the chat, I have a link on my in my clipboard um, that I was letting Aperva know since we're starting to wrap up um, to please um, think about what you may want future office hour conversations to include. Uh, we do have a way for you to um, drive our future conversations and topics. And so if you have a moment, please let us know in this quick and easy form. Are there any other questions or comments that we may have missed in the chat? Um, Regina has been um, providing some additional details about the uh, support that they offer at Michigan State. Feel free to let us know if we've missed anything before we thank our guests. I think we got all of the questions that are in the chat, but it looks like um, this OER, uh, this conversation on OER and languages is not certainly the last. Regina mentions that um, at the upcoming Open Education Conference in October, she'll be moderating a panel with Saddam and Iman, um, supporting OER creation in the least commonly taught languages. So if you all can get a chance to attend there, I would highly recommend it. Um, and Sarah has also mentioned that uh, Coral is going to start doing office hours for language. So if you ever if you're a language educator, if you're working on an OER language project, please feel free, to, feel free to drop into those sessions. And Sarah, can you remind us, anyone is welcome at those drop-in webinars, is that right? Yes, correct. I mean, yeah, it's specifically for languages, but anyone working on language projects. Wonderful. I know that there are a few people in this room today who are working on OER projects, and I, I think we might want to continue the conversation at office hours ourselves, but that would be a great place to start. Uh, Thank you all. And I'll just turn maybe to all three of you speakers. Any final words on your end before we officially wrap up for today? I mean, other than just thank you for having me um, and uh, thank you for letting me share uh, some of my experiences. Uh, it, it was a joy to to both talk to you and it was a joy over uh, the last several years to, to build this project out. So, um, you know, if it, it's a lot of work uh, to do a project like this, but uh, it, for me, at least, it was very rewarding. Yeah, thank you. And I hope we can all keep in touch about all the great work everyone's doing. I think we're echoing thanks all around. Um, Karen, I'll let you close us out for today in that case. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for joining us at Office Hours. Thank you to our three guests, Saddam Issa, Sarah Sweeney, and Christian Hilchi. It was a delight, and we look forward to seeing you again in the future. Take care. Take care, everybody. Thank you.